Uh, you know, I'm going to read a passage of scripture I'll be speaking from today. Would you like to stand with me as we read the word of the Lord? And of course, it's going to be the passage from John, the third chapter. I'm going to begin at verse 1. Why don't you find that in the word of the Lord? Possibly they'll have that on the screens today. But first, let me say unto you, thank you so much for the manifest presence that you've always promised us, that when we would come together in your name, there you would be right among us. And that is what I pray for it now, which is, of course, that which I always pray for. And that is that there would be an unfolding revelation of you who are the most high God, the glorious one, whose name is Jesus. Would you stamp your image upon us, open to us the light and the revelation of who you are. Speak into our spirit, for our heart is open, our ears are tuned toward you, and our eyes are fixed upon you. We worship you. We exalt you. We bless you. If anybody's there with me, just shout amen to that, would you please? All right. So from John chapter 3 here, let's read the passage. It says there was a, a, a man uh, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now wait, I'm going to show you four things this morning. Here's the first one I'm going to talk about in just a moment. I want to say it again. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see. Someone shout see. see. Now help me with this. Preach. Help me preach this, would you please? I want to say it again. He cannot see, see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Someone say enter. enter. That's the second thing we're going to talk about. The first thing is going to be you must see it. The second thing is, is until you see it, you cannot enter it. But once you see it, you can enter into these things. Come on, I want to see it and I want to get it. How about you? Yeah. All right. And have it be manifest with the NS. So here he says, all right. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Here's a must for you, all right? It's not what I'm going to drive home today, but I'm going to throw it out there. There's a lot of things that are available. There are a lot of things that God has laid out on the table for you. I thank God for divine healing. It's not a must. You can be healed. If you prefer to stay sick, wonderful, you'll go to heaven sooner. Um, you know, uh, he's made great provision as far as for your daily needs. You can go hungry if you want, but you don't have to because he's made available to you all that you could need and all that you desire. But here is a must. You must. Be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone. Someone say everyone. everyone. That's the third thing I'm going to talk about. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You need to see, understand your identity and know how to function in it. And the final thing we're going to talk about is from that wonderful verse 16 of John 3. If you move down to that where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Look again, God so loved the who? Oh, now don't forget that. He loved the world. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you. Now, I, I really love this story uh, uh, so much because, well, a couple of reasons. One, because it, it reveals to us much about the person of Christ. And then secondly, it also unveils the nature of the kingdom itself unto us. Now, let me say something to you that uh, will, will kind of set the pace for where we're going, where you can understand. In fact, you're, when you hear me speak, you would often hear this. As a pastor, I taught this a lot to our folks. And that is this, that the goal of the believer is not to go to heaven. I'm going to run up against most of what Christians teach because most of Christianity will tell you that here's the goal. You get forgiven of your sins so you don't, you don't get clubbed, okay? And, and then you don't, you don't have to go to hell, but then you, you, know, you live the best you can, and then in the end, 
You die and you go to get, and you get to go to heaven. That's that's the whole that's that's the real deal right there. And people even say that they think that ministries are all about you know uh, uh, depopulating hell and populating heaven. I want you to understand. I believe that God has a great reward for us after we leave this present world. That is not the goal. The goal is not heaven. Someone say say with me. The goal's not heaven. All right, that's kind of like a, a side benefit. The goal is this, and that is to grow up into him in all things. He puts his seed within us that Christ would be formed in us. Now, hear what I'm saying. This is not a super spiritual aspect of it. This is the truth of the matter. God gave birth to us by putting within us his DNA. The seed of the Most High God was put within our life. What God is looking for is for Christ to be manifest within our life, that he who is the light of the world would shine in this present world of darkness through those who are carrying that light within them. That Christ would be seen in his majesty, that Christ would be seen in his glory, that Christ would be seen in his amazing wisdom, that Christ would be seen in his compassion, that Christ would be seen in his authority, in his dominion, and in his power, that he'd be witnessed in the earth by us, and that will be a draw factor from those that are in darkness to come into the kingdom of God. In fact, only to the degree of which Jesus is revealed to you, are you able to actually access him, draw from him, and become purposeful within him. Do you understand your ability to function in the kingdom is always in direct proportion to the revelation of Christ Jesus within you. When you see him, you can move in him in that very way. And you must understand that that's part of the goal. The goal is that you would flow in him, that he would not only be seen in you, but you would see him and then move in this world as he is. Uh, you got to know how to function today in that which is the unseen kingdom. The, the kingdom is to come in a visible way, but it is now in the reality way. And to the degree of which you function in the kingdom now will determine where your placement will be in the kingdom then. May I say that again? Uh, that's the reason why Jesus taught many parables. One, like when he talked about a, uh, uh, an owner that took a trip and he left, uh, he left potential with three men. Do you remember that? Talents that he gave to them. He gave one, one talent because that was the range of his ability. To another, he gave five talents. It was the range of his ability. The other one, he gave ten talents. After a long time, he returns. When he does, he takes an accounting of what was done. All right? And, and then what he says in the end, and I'm not going to teach that because that will take too much time today. But in the end, this is what he said. Uh, according to what they did with what they were given, the potential that they had, that's where they would be placed. And so he said, you, you've been faithful in a few things. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you a ruler of many things. I don't know if you understand this, but again, the goal is not to go to heaven. The goal is, listen, the goal is not for us when we die to lay down by the river of life for eternity while angels fan us with big feather fans and feet us giant grapes and we strum you know harps right there while, while, uh, while, while angels sing around us and that's have all want to be great that's not what it's about you're actually going to be effective powerful and influential in the kingdom of God we're made to rule and I will just say to you very kindly you can't be a dud here and a king there I'm glad we took the offering before the message. Yeah, you can't, just, you can't just live a life here of managing this world's desires. Having a good job, getting a good vacation, having a nice family, being a kind guy, and, and hit church once in a while, and then go to heaven and be at the top of the game. Come on, guys. We need to know how to live now in the unseen kingdom that will soon be manifest. So verse 3, jumping right to that, and understanding the context of it, what you've got is Nicodemus. He's, he's one of the higher-ups in the Jewish community, and he's going to have a meeting with Jesus. Now, you do understand that at that time, and, and even now, but at, at that time, Jesus was not largely embraced by the religious community. 
In fact, they didn't, they didn't get him at all. And so uh, when he had encounters with them, it was rarely pleasant. Uh, they were often vindictive. They were always trying to corner him. They were trying to get him to say things in such a way that they could grab him and put him down. Uh, they even at times sent guards to take him away. They were always out to, to do something bad to Jesus. And now he's got this guy, you know, from one of the top ranks saying, I want to have a meeting with you at night. So when Nicodemus comes, the first thing he does is clear the air. That's the reason why he, he said to the Lord when he, when he sat down with him that night, he said, let me tell you where I'm coming from. I just want you to understand, I, I know what most of the guys are like. I know what most of my friends are like. I'm not there. I'm not like them. I have watched the works that you've done, and here's where I stand. I'm convinced that you've come from God because no man could do these things unless God is with him. Now, you would have thought that Jesus would have responded like, like let's, let's high-five that one, dude. At least someone has figured this out. Good for you. But that's not how he deals with him. He actually comes right back at him. And he says to him, oh, 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 oh. You, so you think, because you've watched some unexplainable things. So, so you think you see now. You think you, you see the kingdom. Here, here's, the real, here's the real deal, guy. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot see. Don't, don't tell me that you're seeing this because you actually don't even have the capacity to see this yet. I wonder what that moment was like when he said that to Dick and Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus is kind of taken off by this. He's, he's thrown off and he says, well, you know, how's this work out? He said, uh, am I supposed to like go back into my mother's body and come out a second time? I mean, how, what are you talking about? In fact, we didn't read the whole discussion that happens with him when he starts talking about other things of the Spirit. But Jesus comes right back at him at one point and says to him, look, he says, man, you're a leader in Israel and you don't know these things? I'm going to tell you, there was a certain amount of tension, I think, that was in the air at that point. He said to him, unless you're born again. In other words, you don't get this by observation. You don't get this by study. You get it by transformation. There's a supernatural moment in which he who is life will give birth to you in the spirit. He will open up that dimension of you that has put, been put to death because of sin. It will come alive. And when it comes alive, you'll be able to see things that you were not able to see before. In fact, you, you, you understand that your spirit has senses, and they're like counterparts to our natural senses. We, we see, we taste, we hear. But do you understand that in the spirit, it's the very same thing? It's not metaphoric. It is a reality that when this body of mind dies, and, and, and returns back to the dust of the earth. Do you understand? I'm not going to be blind. I'm actually going to see in that spirit realm, and I'm going to see better than what I see now. I will hear better than what I hear now. Come on. And all of the other senses plus are there within our life. I'm going to tell you something that the text I told you we talk about things I love about are many things, but it reveals so much about who Jesus is, what he's like, and it reveals so much about his kingdom. I'm going to tell you that one of the greatest obstacles to seeing Jesus isn't the devil. It's our preconceived ideas of him. See, now, I'm talking to you that one of the keys to function well in life is to know Jesus and see him fully, and that happens through the revelation of himself through the word of God. But one of our biggest obstacles that we ever face is not, you know, we think that our obstacles to see Jesus is, is the devil even working on us and all that, and I understand there's demonic activity. I understand there's a real one called the devil, but the devil's really not our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is our own preconceived picture of what this Jesus must be, must be like, and that's the only Jesus that we'll see. Because everything else we ignore. And we say, well, that can't be him. But I'm going to tell you that he rarely fits our preconceived pictures. You'll find that what people do is they want to pick out passages, maybe from the Bible, statements that Jesus made, or certain things that Jesus did that fits their personal concept of what they believe Jesus is like. So if they want Jesus to be kind, then that's all they see of him in Scripture. They don't see other kinds of things about him. If they think that Jesus is all about demonstrating power, then they don't understand the element of suffering or the challenges that come along in life. But if they think that Jesus is all about just suffering, then they never see deliverance or authority in there. They have a pre 
could see a picture of him. And, and a great example is the Jews themselves back at that time. Uh, the, the Jews had one real strong understanding of what it would be like when Christ the Messiah would come. And that is that he was going to come as a warlord. He was going to come as a ruler. He was going to come uh, riding a white horse with deep authority. He would overthrow the government systems of this world, which at that point were oppressing Israel. All right, So they had faith that if he came in their time, he was going to overthrow the Roman government. He was going to raise those from the dead who had died, and he would restore to Israel their place of power and authority in the world and that's how they understood him and that's the reason why when he came here the light of God came and stood right among them they didn't know who they were looking at when they were seeing him right in the face now he did things at times that really confused them because there were certain things that he did that looked like what Messiah would be but it didn't fit the whole picture so they kept saying well I, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't get who this guy is alright uh, he sure makes me wonder but uh, they didn't buy into him and the reason why it wasn't the devil it was because of their preconceived ideas of who he was and by the way those kind of filters are with everybody I've given you an example of what it was for the Jews, but the truth is, it's, it's, it's for all of us. I, one of the key things that I pray constantly, I have done it for years, is I ask the Lord to help me get past the filters that keep me from seeing who he really is. That means sometimes your life has filters because of the pains you've gone through. Uh, sometimes your life has filters because... You've had it real good in a certain area, and you don't even understand what it's like to be another way. And you think that God is only about that kind of thing. And a lot of us have uh, a religious filter. Some of you have never had a religious background. you got filters, too. You got cra- what you've got is CNN filters of what Jesus is like. So what we have whatever. We've got a world concept of him. And then we try to, we try to find that Jesus among us, instead of letting him take the blinders off of our eyes, remove the spiritual cataracts, and reveal himself for who he truly and actually is. And and it takes a miracle to get past that. I'm going to tell you, even the Apostle Paul, who had witnessed him and had been in the third heavens, who had had tremendous revelation of him, having written more than, what was it, more than half of the New Testament, he himself still said that when we look at Christ and we look at the kingdom, it's though we're looking through darkly fogged glass. We're, We're not actually seeing it clearly for what it really is. And so I keep that in mind at all times, that whatever I see of him, that is accurate, I know one thing to be true, he's he's way more than that. I don't ever say, well, now we've arrived, got it, I've seen it, now I know, I realize, oh no, whatever I've seen that is actually true, he's a whole lot more than that, and whatever I have seen, he's probably, I'm probably not even seeing that as clearly as what I can possibly see, and and, and I wish I could say to you that we could just lay hands on you today and that all fall away, and and that won't be true, but but it is true, in fact, even with the Lord's own disciples, he dealt with that all the time because one of the key questions that was asked to him, if you've read scripture, whenever people kind of got a clue that the one that was standing in front of them was a little more than what they thought, you know, one of the first things they'd say when they talked about the kingdom, when's the kingdom going to come? When's the kingdom going to appear? You know, what are the signs of the kingdom? That's, that was what they were, con- they were all, because that, that's what they thought this was all about. And I mean, I look at this, I consider even uh, in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 through 8, uh, you're at the point of the ascension. Now, this is, he has walked with them, he has taught them, he's worked his miracles, he's sat with them, he's ate with them, he showed them his heart. He has been crucified, he has risen from the dead, he's talked to them now for 40 days on and off as he's appeared to them of things and the scriptures says of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now he's standing before them in flesh, he's about to ascend out of this world. I'm about to leave right now, but before I go, is there, is there any Anything you want to know? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got one question. Good. What is that question? And this is what they said. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I just almost wonder if he didn't go <laughs> at that point. And he answers them and he says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. But listen to this. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He was talking about Pentecost, something that was going to happen in just a few days. 
all right? Is but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So what he's saying to them is, look, you want to understand, you want to know when that visible kingdom is about to appear. All right, all right, that's not for you to know right now, but here's what's going to happen. You're going to be empowered in just a few days. Something's going to happen in you that's going to open to you the authority of the kingdom while you're still living in this present world. And, and he's trying to get us to the point of seeing how to live now and that which is the unseen kingdom. Do you see what I'm talking about? And it comes in proportion to the revelation of Christ that is within us because you can't enter the kingdom and you can't see the kingdom beyond the revelation of the Christ himself. So whatever you've desired, you say, well, I want to go stronger in God, then good, then get a picture of the champion. So I need to be healed in my body. If that's really nice, then, then have an encounter with Christ the healer. It takes more than a theology of healing to get you healed. It takes a moment with Christ. The same with salvation. You don't get saved by being trained in religious ways. You have to have an encounter with the Savior. You don't get saved by the indoctrination of the book. You get saved by the author of the book. There must come that moment within your life. Am I helping anybody this morning? So, so one of our greatest struggles in actually seeing Christ has to do with, with our own preconceived ideas. I gave the example of Israel. You, you understand what it is in this day, don't you? Well, well, there's many of them, but one of the primary ones that's out right now is that this generation has a filter over their eyes of a, if they believe in Jesus at all, uh, they see him or are looking for a soft teddy bear Jesus that only cuddles and loves and never corrects. And whenever they see anything at all that looks like it brings correction into a moment, then they go screaming down the don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me uh, road. They don't, they don't seem, I don't know. That's the reason why they have a hard time seeing this one who when he was walking down the road one day and a woman came to him, but she wasn't a Jewish woman, she was a Greek, a Syrophoenician woman. She's got a little girl that's home that's demon-possessed and sorely t uh, tormented by this devil, and she makes an appeal on him to, uh, for the deliverance of her daughter. He doesn't even, he doesn't even listen. He keeps, keeps on moving, and his disciples are there, and finally they come to him and say, would you please deal with her because she's nagging us and wearing us out. Now, I don't have time to teach all this, but, but the kingdom functions in covenant levels, and at that time, the covenant was unto Israel. Jesus told his own disciples, we're not going to the cities of the Gentiles, but only two, and he called it the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they didn't go to Rome in Jesus' day. When he walked the earth as a man, he never did that. Right? He stayed within the covenant people. And so she's making a demand on that which is outside of the covenant of that hour. It may be hard for you to understand because you have a preconceived idea about Jesus, is that he's a teddy bear and, and when, you, when you squeeze him, he should squeak for you. But what happened when she pushed him is he turned around and he said, it's not proper for me to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a really hard statement. Are you hearing that? That's a rough, especially a hurting lady just like that. And then she's going to turn around and say, but, Lordy, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. And the passion of her soul, the desire of her heart, coupled with that faith, caused a miracle to happen that extent. oh, my God, that extended beyond covenant boundaries in that hour. Oh, that's a shouting spot right there. I'm telling you, this is what Jesus is like, but we don't always see him that way if we have filters on our eyes. We don't understand stand this one that walks into the temple where they got money changers that are that are doing stuff that violates the whole idea of how the kingdom functions and he doesn't just go off on them he actually because people talk about him flipping the tables over and he did that but he first went to the corner and he watched them you read the text and he made a whip he, he didn't grab a whip he made a whip he's taking some time with this thing he is thinking it through and when he comes out of that corner i'm telling you people are getting a licking real quick just like that and and he's throwing their tables over. How does that fit the teddy bear Jesus? When he was speaking one day to a group of religious leaders where there were Pharisees, doctors of the law, and Sadducees, which are three distinct different groups, and they kind of didn't like each other because they all thought they had a better angle on it than the other guy. Jesus is going down on the Pharisees, and the other guys are, yeah, they need to get whipped up on. But before long, he started crossing a little bit of the lines. And so one of the guys spoke up, and he says, all right, I hear what you're saying to the Pharisees, but the things you're starting to say right now, hey, 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 wait just a minute. You could offend us. Man, he turned right on them, man. He was right there like a bulldog and came down on those guys. Uh, you've offended us. In fact, the scripture talks about him as being like a rock of offense. Now, 
let, let, me, let me address this for just a minute, because that's not the only way he was, all right? I mean, he's also the, he's also the one that when the lady was caught in the, uh, in the act of adultery and, and the people that drug her there to stone her, he miraculously found a way to find her liberated and set her free from sin, going, sin no more. It, see, he's, he's not just one way. Don't let your blinders keep you from seeing the fullness of who he is. You must see him in the fullness of the word. But I was looking at these things that I've been just talking to you about because we're living in a world right now that uh, no offense is the whole idea. You can't offend me. If you offend me, then I, you know, I can't, I can't survive it, you know. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, if you live that way, you're going to miss the kingdom. Now, my mentor taught me this. When I read the word of God and saw God doing something or saying something, I, I needed to say to the Lord, not only what did you do, but why did you do it? He said, you must understand his heart before you can understand his hand. Did I say that too fast or did you get that? So I, whenever I study the word of God, I can't help myself. When I read the word of the Lord and I hear him say something or do something, I don't just say, oh, I want to know more about what you did. I, more than that, I want to know why you did it. There's reasons why God does the things that he does. And if you don't understand his motive, his heart, you're never going to understand his actions. And I'm watching him do these certain things like we just talked about. And I thought, why, why, why would you, it really looks like you intentionally offend offend someone why would you do something like that and here's what i'm going to tell you in order to be able to see this kingdom and in order to be able to enter into the function of it you say well you got to have faith well yes but it's more than that you have to have desire it's the hungry and the thirsty that get filled not those that are the most informed and who believe better than the rest we think it all comes through, through the development of understanding. So we spend a lot of time in, t in today's church teaching people because we think that the more we can teach them about it, the better they'll be able to get it. But that's really not, really not how it works. There's something more fundamental than just being taught, and that is having the desire, the hunger, the thirst. That's why the Scripture uses those two terms frequently about being hungry and thirsty because they're the strongest drives that people have. I tell folks that, you know, if you're not hungry, here's the deal. We can put a great gourmet meal in front of you, a five-course uh, meal, wonderfully prepared, and you'll just pick around and not hardly eat anything at all because you're just not hungry. It may be that you've already filled yourself with junk, or it may be that you're ill and you just don't have hunger at all within you. And so anyway, you won't enter into it. You won't, you won't consume it. But if you're hungry... If you're hungry, let me explain something. You don't need a gourmet meal to eat. You'll be happy with a cold gas station burrito. Well, a hungry person will push through. He will get past the offense. And Jesus knew that the only ones that are going to enter the kingdom are those that see the narrow way that understand how this happens. And so he would intentionally at times throw out the roadblocks because he knew that the only guys that were going to get in were the people that could get past, hello, the roadblocks. I'm going to tell you something. Whatever it takes to offend you is all it takes to defeat you. So the key to knowing him is to see him in the fullness of his word, let the Holy Spirit take the blinders off your eyes and see who he is. And I'm going to tell you that this world poorly reflects him. The best of this world poorly reflects him. He is beyond anything that this world can really put together and show you. He, he's, he's, he's beyond the beauty of the diamond. He is superior to the sunset or the sunrise. He's spectacular in every way. The only way that you can really know him is to see him in the reality of his unveiling, and that often happens through the word of the living God. And that's the reason why I tell people you need to read the whole book because he's seen throughout it. You can't just pick the passages you like and use them and say, that's who he is, and that's what he's like, and, and watch this. And and that's the only God I'll believe in. Did you hear what I just said? You need to know him. Old and new, by the way, he's the same all the way through. He's the same Jesus. I'm not going to build on that, because, but I'm just going to throw something out again. It's a little counter Christianity to most people. They think he was God in the old this way. He was a God of strong judgment and harsh. New Testament, he's the teddy bear. But that's not true. 
he's the same all the way through. He, didn't, he, doesn't, he never changed at any point. Because in the old, you'll find compassion and mercy a lot. David sang about it, wrote about it. Moses, the lawgiver, wrote about it all the time, about the mercy and the compassion of the almighty God. And yes, there were the judgment moments. And, but in the New Testament, you see the same thing. He's a God of great compassion and mercy. But he also knew how to straighten your string out real fast if he needed to. He just did. Open your heart and your mind to the word, all right? So that's, that's verse 3. Let me jump into verse 5 with you right now. And on verse 5 is going to show us this, that insight precedes entrance. Say that with me. Insight precedes entrance, all right? So in verse 3, he talks about seeing the kingdom. In verse 5, he talks about entering the kingdom. So he's already talked about this is how you're going to see it. You have to be born again. There must, you must come alive on the inside, and then you're going to see these things. Once you see them, then you can move into them. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter. Someone shout, enter. He cannot enter the kingdom. So you've you got to see it to enter it. Sometimes people, we've heard people say, well, seeing is believing, and then people put them down for that. But actually, that's the truth. You've got to see it before you can believe it. There must come the light and the revelation of God. Oh, I'm not talking about seeing things of this natural world to make you believe because there will never be enough of that to do it. But your eyes must be open before you can embrace who he is. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. He shines the light of Christ upon our heart. That light that pierces all darkness comes and shines upon us. When we see him, we can embrace him and we can enter it then. You see, that's the key to this whole thing. The opening of the spiritual eye, the hearing with the spiritual ear. Let me tell you that, what, now listen to what I'm going to say. Whatever you see, you can do. And, what, and whatever you hear, you will become. Let me say that again. Whatever you see, you can do. In other words, we, uh, that scripture says it like this way. We cannot walk in darkness, but we walk in the light. So when the light of God comes, you know what we're able to do? We're able to move in that. The word walk means to conduct yourself or to function, all right? So you can walk in light. You can't, you can't walk in theory. You can only walk in light. You, you can't walk in doubt or in fear. You can only walk in light. And when the light comes, when he shines the light upon you, that, when that light comes, that's not just like, oh, look at the possibilities that are out there. No, whatever you see, when that light comes, to the, to the degree of which you can see, you can do it. That's how you enter the kingdom. It's in that very way you first see it. When you see it, you can enter it. And then whatever you hear, you'll become. Because when the word of God is declared and spoken, it is creative in nature. That's why when Jesus would preach, he wouldn't stop and say, will someone say amen or will someone say praise God? But he would say, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And he knew even though the crowd was out there and there would be thousands of people that would be hearing with these ears, they were not necessarily the ones that were entering into the kingdom. It was those that was hearing with the ears of the Spirit. Because when the gospel is, is actually being ministered, and there's a difference between the ministry of the gospel and, and someone uh, giving a religious oration as a sermon. The ministry of the gospel has a supernatural dimension to it. So we are proclaiming something with our mouth that is heard with these ears. That, and so also, I like to say it like this, that the gospel is always transmitted when ministered on two frequencies. There is that which is heard with the natural ear, with its mouth, within the range of hearing that the human being has. But there is another ear. It's the ear of the spirit. And there's another voice that is speaking. It is the voice of the almighty God. It is the rhema of the most high. It is one that, that calls the deep, calls unto the deep and he speaks within the hearts of men those that hear that voice become what they hear because the word of the Lord is not just informative it is creative when he said let there be light guess what happened there was light and whatever you hear you'll become am I helping you again today so you enter the kingdom it happens first by insight there must come the revelation of who he is there comes the unveiling the removal of the uh, of the filters from our eyes and we see it once we see it we can enter into that which we have seen because you can move you can, oh Jesus you can move in the areas that you've seen he doesn't just show you things to tease you. He shows you things because that's why now, now, 
Now, what you can do. So, son, what you've seen in the spirit and what you've seen in the spirit, daughter, you can do. Those very pictures that the Lord has given to you are not bogus ideas or pie in the sky. They are realities of the sphere of your authority and your influence. I'm going to tell you the same thing to you. I saw that when I was praying about you today. That the things, the real ideas that you've seen in the Holy Ghost, that he's birthed within you, the kind of things that go beyond what flesh can do. Your mind says, how can that ever happen? You can do that because you've seen it. What you see, you can do. There's so many things that God has revealed on the various ones of you. You need to know that what you see, you can enter into. So there comes sight. Come on. There comes revelation. There comes power. So you hear on two frequencies because the gospel is proclaimed on two frequencies. And I suggest to you something else. The kingdom is seen on a broader spectrum of light waves. You know, we only see a certain amount of light, but there's more there than what we can see. You do, everybody knows that. That's not bogus thought. It's not science fiction. We have x-rays. We have, we have infrared. We can photograph it, but we can't see it because our eyes can't see that. Oh, there's, there's a day coming when we will not be bound by the abilities of the rods and cones that are in our eyeballs, but we will see way beyond that because the truth of the matter is, is you don't actually see with your eyes anyhow. You see with your brain. Even in this natural, the light that comes in through the eye, you all understand, is transmitted information to the brain, which forms an image and picture of what it believes it is looking at. I'm going to tell you, there is one that knows how to reveal himself, and he bypasses the eyeball. He bypasses the limitation of the brain. He manifests himself unto us, and we behold him in that way. There's a day coming that we will see the kingdom in that sense, because the kingdom is now, even though it is yet to come. Elisha under, uh, understood it of old, and that's why when the Syrian army was surrounding them to attack them and put them under, he was not unnerved by it. His own servant came alongside one of the guys from the school and said, we're dead, we're dead in the morning, they're all going to kill us. He said, well, it's not true. He said, there's more for us than those that be against us. And he's thinking, the, the servant is thinking, how can that be? We only have a few, you know, few people here at the school, and there's a whole army out there. He said, God, would you, just, would you open his eyes for a minute and let him see? And all of a sudden, there comes an unveiling. And he saw that the whole mountainside was filled with the warriors of God, angels uh, and, and chariots of power that were there. They were already there. They were actually there the whole time. He just didn't see them. Once he saw them, he could enter into that place of faith and power and battle in that. Come on. Psalms 36 and verse 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. Psalms 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word is both a book and a person. The apostle Paul would pray this in Ephesians 1 and verse 17 and 18. He says, I pray, he's talking to the Ephesian church. He says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is. And then he starts listing stuff. You've got to see it in order to enter it. Once you see it, you can enter it. All right. Now let me move down to verse 8. Time's going by. Can I take a few more minutes with you? I'm going to talk about that the kingdom is not predictable by this world's measurement standards. And I'm talking about how do you function in the kingdom? How do you move in kingdom ways? Well, here's how it happens, my friend. You can't measure it by the ways of this world. Jesus said the wind blows where it wills. And then he says, and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. In other words, you can feel it. Hmm, you can be aware of it. But you can't control it. You can't predict it. and You can't govern it. I'm talking about how the kingdom functions. It's not predictable by the way this world measures things. The desire to analytically control your life and the things of God are going to castrate you in the spirit. The kingdom doesn't function by this world's ways. Old time Pentecost used to say a little phrase like this. They said it's better caught than taught. What they meant by that, not that there's no place for teaching, but if you think you're going to catch it just through indoctrination, it's not going to happen. You have to get into the environment, and you have to come to the point that you have an open sensitivity where you can (laughs) see which way the wind is blowing. You can't create that wind. You can't control that wind, but you can catch that wind. Did you hear that? You can set your sails once you know where it's going and you can pick it up that way and he will carry you along into your purpose into into the places of his power and into awesome beyond imagination fruitfulness in him 
But the desire to control is born of fear, anxiety, and it will end in failure in your life. You've got to learn how to go with the flow of the kingdom and catch the wind. Catch the wind. That's a, that's a real challenge. And the final thing I'm going to say to you now is out of verse 16. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. Come on. That whoever, someone shout whoever, who would believe on him would not, they wouldn't perish, they would die without hope. That's what perish means. But have everlasting life. I've heard people say in the church so many times, and they'll point to an icon in the church of the cross, and they'll say, oh, look at the cross. The cross shows us how much God loves his children. But that's not true. The cross actually shows us how much God loved his enemies. We must understand this. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross showed us how much God loved the world. He's speaking to Nicodemus, whose whole worldview is that Messiah comes for the Jewish people and will rise them up to a place of authority, and Jesus pushes him beyond that. And he says, no, God actually loves the world. The apostle Paul would be heard by the Jewish people for a while, sometimes when he would speak to them because of his great education and his higher position. And then when he said, and he's included the Gentiles, that's it. They shut him down right there and wanted him to be killed. They had a picture of what the kingdom was like, and they couldn't see it any other way. But I'm going to tell you something wonderful. I've spoken to you of deep things, of spiritual things, and maybe some of you might be out there saying, well, this is great for someone like, you know, like the pastors among us or high spiritual leaders or really deep sages in the kingdom of God. But actually, you're included in this. And I'm not trying to be a kind teddy bear Jesus when I say this. I'm saying you are included, every one of us, in this. He actually loved you before you entered the kingdom, before you bought into him, before you embraced him. And I'm going to say this, that if God loved the world that much, how much does he love his own? Hello. I think you're loved beyond measure. You have a strong destiny in Christ. And it's not something that someday when we go to heaven. It's right now. And it's to come, but it's right now. You need to discover who he is, his kingdom and how to function in it. It's going to be counterculture to this world. It always is. It always is. Not because he's trying to just mean, be mean or stick out. It always is. Because there's nothing of this world that can really reflect or grasp what his kingdom is like. So you've got to understand it's not going to always be politically correct. It's not always going to make people around you comfortable. It's all right. In fact, if you live a life that fits real well in this world, you're missing the kingdom altogether. You should stand out like a sore thumb. The Bible refers to us as being a peculiar people, an odd people, a people that people of the world just don't get, they don't understand. That's you. You have this. Discover it. And don't miss this for the world. <laughs> Would you stand with me all over the house, please? Hey, come on, Shaka. Would you take a moment and absorb him right now? Would you, could you worship him with me? And I'm not asking you to sing. Would you recognize who he is, his worth? And bless him right now. How I worship you. Come on, open your heart for a moment. Tell him who he is. Tell him you love him. Express your desire and your hunger for him. For he's come to you today. He's here right now. On the Risha Habrunta Aleki. How glorious you are beyond what my mind can think and way beyond what my tongue can describe you are. I'm so grateful for the help of the Spirit that opens my eyes and the verbiage of the Spirit that allows me to pray even beyond myself and speak of your wonder and your glory. How I honor you today, almost oh, God. Thank you for having compassion upon us and shining your light on us, not after we straightened up and believed, not after we repented, for we could not have repented, neither could we have believed had you not first taken the initiative to reveal yourself to us, to embrace us, to speak to our heart, to call us out of darkness into the kingdom of 
your dear son in love. I pray this now. Now here's how I'm going to minister to you. I pray this right now upon you. I mean, if you'll receive this, open your heart right now and receive the blessing. I pray this upon you right now that the light of who Christ is would become an ever-increasing light unto you. The, right, the scripture says the path, the righteous grows brighter and brighter unto the dawning of the day. That's the day of his appearing. May the light of God that is within you get brighter and brighter, brighter and brighter. May you move from faith to faith and from glory to glory. May there be an, an, an inward and outwards transformation within you that causes you to see who he is and what this kingdom is like. The joy that you walk in when things are depressing. The, the, the wealth that you can draw from when things are economically hard. The health that you may receive from him even when your body is under attack. Come on. The peace that you walk in even when you live in a world of agitation. May you have the light of that within you and may that be reflected in you. Not only in that which is to come but you seize it in the now and it is manifested in such a way that the world looks at you and says what is this and how can this be may it birth a hunger in others that they may also enter in may you live a life uh, it causes others to embrace Christ. Now be filled with his presence. Come on, be filled with his presence and his glory, even now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.